largest city, believe it or not, in Texas at that time. It was saying that every year Galveston's economy increased 50%. Now, uh, Galveston is a city on a barrier island that uh, actually uh, the Boulevard Peninsula and Galveston Island have an inlet, and then you go into a channel that is known as the Galveston Channel. Um, and uh, so basically, um, despite its commercial value, see, it created a commercial value in the 1950s. And as a result of that, it did no long, it did not have a fixed fortification like you see at uh, um, Beaufort, North Carolina, Fort Macon, and so forth. Um, so the growth of Galveston is very surprising, uh, but the need to export, you see, if you're in Texas, they don't have many railroads. They built a railroad between Houston and Galveston, which will play part of our story. But, uh, I think, um, uh, that, um, uh, it's a, um, uh, interesting story, in other words. So um, now, um, as soon as the war breaks out, um, a man known as Colonel John S. Ford, who actually had fought at the Battle of San Jacinto, he's one of those Texas heroes, uh, he will actually capture U.S. forts along the Rio Grande Valley. And as a result of that, he'll send 12 cannon uh, to... Uh, believe it or not, uh, Galveston to try and create fortifications. They tried to build fortifications on Boulevard Point, and uh, they actually took two cannon, known as the Twin Sister, that were used at the Battle of San Jacinto, and they brought them down to uh, Galveston. And so um, the big story, I think, is um, that... Uh, uh, the uh, Confederates are ill-prepared uh, for actually um, trying to make all this happen. I, uh, um, let me see, I got to do something with my screen share for a moment um, because I'm having trouble advancing my pictures. Um, so, uh, okay, so anyway, let me get back to my story. Um, so the big thing is, is that uh, Galveston is uh, and it, it increases in importance as a result of um, the fall of uh, once the Union set up uh, their John, you're muted. We can't hear you. You're muted. Unmuted you here. Is that better? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, Sorry. Good. So that's okay. Um, now, so anyway, they'll build fortifications at Pelican Spit, uh, which is a little island right off of Galveston, as well as at Boulevard Point. But the war comes very quickly to Galveston. On July 2nd, 1861, the blockader, the USS South Carolina, arrived off the mouth of um, the uh, um, mouth of the entrance to Galveston Bay. Uh, this ship was a passenger ship that the US Army, or US Navy, had transformed into a warship. It's iron hulled, it's a screw steamer, armed with four eight-inch shell guns and one 32-pounder that outranged all the guns at Galveston. Now, everyone gets all upset. Uh, the South Carolina is commanded by James Alden. He actually captures 11 Confederate blockade runners while he is there. So the local Texans get all upset and under the leadership of Major Joseph J. Cook, uh, a, a Naval Academy graduate, uh, he will organize seven companies of heavy artillery, including the Houston Artillery and the Ga Davis Guards, which is a whole nother great story. 
Um, then a group of local citizens go to Richmond to plead to get uh, heavy artillery to defend Galveston. Now, all of a sudden, everyone realizes how important Galveston is, and so the Confederates will name a um, individual known as uh, Brigadier General Paul O. Hebert. And Hebert was a class of 1840 at West Point. He uh, was after the Mexican War, which he was lauded for his service. He became chief engineer of the state of Louisiana. Then he actually will become governor of Louisiana. And he creates a railroad system and founds Louisiana State University and so forth. As soon as Louisiana leaves the Union, uh, he will be named Brigadier General and placed in command of the District of Texas. He was all just confronted right away with the problems of defending this long coastline with only so many inlets, but without any fixed um, brick or masonry fortifications. Uh, he actually writes uh, Benjamin, Judah Benjamin, Secretary of War at that time, I regret to say that I find this coast in almost defenseless, indefensive state and in the almost certain want of proper works and armaments, the task of defending successfully at any point against an attack of any magnitude amounts to a military impossibility. Uh, well, you know, he's kind of given up right away. Haber's fear of attack will materialize on May 17, 1862, um, when um, he has to send troops to support Earl Van Doren's army in you know, leading up to the Battle of Pea Ridge. And all of a sudden, another Union uh, ship known as the USS Santee will show up. It's a 44-gun sailing frigate. It actually was laid down in 1820, not finished until 1854. The Santee will demand Galveston surrender. Um, well, they capture or damage uh, four ships off of Galveston Bay. And so a bear removes all of the cannon from Galveston, protecting Galveston, and moves them on to the mainland. Uh, I have to tell you, this is uh, just a mistake. You're kind of giving up uh, Galveston. Well, you know, once um, David Glasgow Farragut has completed his conquest of New Orleans and his operations around uh, Vicksburg, he cast his eyes on the Texas coats. And so he places in command of a squadron, a man known as Captain William Bainbridge Renshaw to capture that port city. Renshaw's commander of this ship, the Westfield, just to let you know. And so Renshaw organizes a pretty powerful squadron, the Harriet Lane, the Oswego, the Clifton, the Sackham, and the Westfield. And also the transports Cavello, Eliza's Pike, and the pilot schooner, the Lacan. Now the side wheel or Harriet Lane was built for the revenue cutter service. And uh, it was built by Webb of New York. Um, it is named for the niece of President James Buchanan. It has one nine inch and two eight inch shell guns on board and two brass 24 pounder um, howitzers. Now they have also the Clifton, which is a former US, or New York ferry boat uh, that has two nine inch Dahlgrens on board and four 32 pounders. Uh, I could go through several others, but I have to tell you that the, the Westfield alone has uh, one hundred pounder rifle, one nine inch Dahlgren and four eight inch shell guns. So this outranges anything the Confederates can have. Actually, on October 4th, 1864, um, Renshaw will enter Galveston Harbor and Hebert will not even try to resist them and he retreats to the mainland. And uh, so the uh, Federals will occupy Galveston on October 9th, 1864. 
Now, I have to tell you, this is, tr is horrible for the Confederates. The trouble is the Navy needs troops to truly occupy the town. And as a result of that, they will send elements of the 42nd Massachusetts Regiment under the command of Colonel Isaac Brunel. Now, they don't arrive until December 24th. They have a position on what's called Coons Wharf, uh, and it's right there on this map. Now, uh, there's a trestle, and that's Coons Wharf, uh, if you can see it in that picture. Um, now, the big trouble is the Federals do not destroy the trestle bridge leading to Galveston Island. And uh, so the, the, the Federals only have 250 soldiers. The rest of the regiment, uh, another 900 men, are supposed to arrive. However, the Federals um, haven't shipped them out quickly enough. And the Confederates will also make a major change. Hay Bear's dismal performance uh, during, as commander of the, uh, com of the Department of Texas, um, was uh, just a failure. In fact, uh, one Texan, Thomas North, wrote, everyone became tired and disgusted with the general and his policy. He was too much of a military cock comb to suit the ideas and ways of a pioneer country besides he was suspected of cowardice. When the Texans learned of the appointment of John Bankhead Magruder, Major General John Bankhead Magruder, uh, known as Prince John, uh, he, they will laud it. In fact, uh, Colonel Ford will say, Magruder's arrival is equal to the addition of 50,000 men. Well, we all know about John Bankhead Magruder. He was a graduate of uh, West Point, class of 1830. He had actually gone to the first class at University of Virginia. Uh, he uh, graduated, uh, of course, 1830 West Point. Uh, he immediately, his uncle, Brigadier General, Brevet Brigadier General James Bankhead, one of the best friends of Winfield Scott, will get him transferred into the artillery. And during the Mexican War, he will command the Company I of the 1st U.S. Artillery, which he turns into a light artillery unit. His commander, uh, Colonel William Harney, will say Captain Magruder's gallantry was conspicuously displayed on several occasions. Magruder was wounded twice. Uh, he will be... Um, breveted to the rank of lieutenant colonel, and uh, basically the Commonwealth of Virginia will give him a gold sword. Oh my gosh, he is quite a dandy, I have to tell you. Um, he was nicknamed Prince John because he was always perfectly uniformed and mustached. He appeared everywhere at a gallop and talked incessantly despite having a slight lisp, which some people said was merely an affectation to allow him to speak um, longer. So um, he had a fondness for military parade. Um, however, he was plagued by his heavy drinking. Uh, and so when the war broke out, he is going to be, a, there's Magruder right there. He will be, saw, uh, the Texans will say, we'll make him a demigod. But that's after Galveston. Anyway, so he comes down to the peninsula and the first land battle of the Civil War will be 10 June 1861 at the Battle of Big Bethel. Oh my gosh, everyone lauds his victory. Uh, his nickname, um, the fighting Johnny B. Magruder. And in fact, um, someone said he's a hero for our times. All right, so Magruder, um, as one person said, he would be riding with his staff, and each one of the enemy feared the appearance of the master of ruses and strategy, Prince John Magruder. Well, after Big Bethel, actually, um, the uh, Jefferson Davis will tell Lee, you need to write Magruder and say, look, you got to stop your drinking, otherwise we won't promote you to Brigadier General. Magruder uh, will write Lee back, and he had, Lee says, you've got to sign a pledge. So Magruder writes him back and said, I have not allowed 
a touch of spiritus liquors to pass my lips since the beginning of this war, and I shall never let that happen again. I promise you, I will remain limited or lack of spiritus liquors. Well, Magruder goes on drinking champagne and brandy, uh, but he gets promoted to Brigadier General, then Major General. He is a hero during the first part of the Peninsula Campaign, during his defense of the Lower Peninsula, known as the Siege of Yorktown. However, uh, Magruder will uh, actually uh, go on sick leave afterwards. Um, his nerves have gotten him. He's prescribed a mixture of brandy and laudanum. Uh, so actually, uh, Lee goes and visits him uh, in Richmond with his son, uh, uh, Custis Lee, and they will say, well, are you ready to come back in duty? We need you. Uh, and Magruder says, I'm ready to serve. I have a problem with the monkeys on the ceiling though. Oh my gosh. But Magruder is brought back into action. He's successful at uh, the Battle of King's School um, and holding four corps of McClellan below the Chickahominy as Lee tries to strike uh, the exposed corps of Fitz John Porter. That results in the Battle of Beaver Dam, Gaines Mill. However, McClellan tries to march across the peninsula and Magruder. Uh, fails to cut off the Federals at Savage Station. He fails at Maverin Hill. Even though Lee has sent him an order and then rescinded the order, it was too late. Magruder sent his brigades in piecemeal. Some people said he was drunk. Uh, now, sometimes people said he was drunk because he had that list. But nevertheless, uh, Magruder will now, uh, you know, what are you going to do with him? Lee thinks that Magruder reminds him of his father, right, a ne'er-do-well, et cetera. And so he will uh, assign him to the, or convinces Jefferson Davis to assign him to the District of Texas. Well, as soon as he arrives in Texas on November 29, 1862, uh, he was met with great fanfare at Houston, and fame seemed to fall upon uh, him naturally. In every fashion, Magruder strove to live up to the honor bestowed upon him. He was a vigorous 52 years old, tall, a wreck, and handsome, and uh, uh, he, with his impressive nature, guaranteed that he would liberate the primary city of Texas, Galveston. Now, he develops a plan where he's going to work um, with uh, two ships uh, that are called uh, the Bayou City and the Neptune. Now, the Neptune, these two ships, they're cotton clads. There he is. I just, that was Leon Smith that just passed. Uh, the Bayou City and the Neptune are what we call cotton. There's the Neptune right there. You see all the cotton out in front. Um, and uh, um, the, the Bayou was commanded by um, Henry Lubbock, the uh, um, brother of the governor of Texas. Uh, and uh, they had one gap gun in the bow of the bayou. Uh, and uh, it was commanded by Captain A.W.A.R. Weir of the 1st Texas Heavy Artillery. Uh, the men had all armed, see there are all these infantrymen uh, under the command of Colonel Thomas Green, we'll see his picture, will actually be assigned onto both ships. Now, I have to tell you, uh, one thing about the Bayou City is that it's going to be fitted with what's called a Corvus. You can't see it here, but it, it is there. There's what a cotton clad looks like. And the Corvus was a boarding device used by the Romans in the Punic Wars. And it'd be about four feet far wide, 36 feet in length. They had a claw that when they dropped the Corvus, it would dig into the deck, there's Leon Smith, deck of the ship and hold it there. Now, this is, this is how all these Texans are gonna rush on board of the Harriet Lane, which is the main target. Then there's another ship, we just saw it, that's Thomas Green right there. 
known as the Neptune. And it's commanded by Captain W.H. Sangster. It only has two 24-pounder howitzers. However, the commander of one of the guns is one of the Galveston Jewish community. His name is Lieutenant Levi Charles Harvey, who had served as a captain in the U.S. Revenue Service uh, for 52 years, right? And so um, he is going to have 150 volunteers from Colonel Bagby's 7th uh, Texas Cavalry on board. One of the soldiers comes up to Harvey and says, you know, they saw all the cotton bales. And uh, one of the nervous sharpshooters asked Harvey whether or not the cotton bales would protect him. He replied, none, whatever, not even against grape shot. Our only chance to get alongside them before they hit us Obviously, these cotton bales give us an appearance of protection. Well, the Naval Squadron is going to be organized up in Harrisonburg, Texas. Um, and uh, basically, uh, Magruder prepares his infantry for assault. Now, this is all, assault was supposed to take place on December 26th, but instead, it's going to be set for the morning of January 1st. Now, what Magruder wants to do is take the cannon across the trestle bridge under the command of Brigadier General William Scurry, um, who fought at the Battle of Glorietta Pass. Uh, and he was going to bring 12 cannon, position them at night so that they could then shell the Coons Wharf as well as the Union ships in the harbor. Actually, Prince John Magruder goes to Harrisburg in the afternoon of December 31st and gives a great speech with all these flags flying and bands playing. And he shouts as his train leaves the station, the Rangers of the Prairie send greetings to the Rangers of the Sea. Oh my gosh. Now, he returns to what's called Virginia Point and um, they will uh, lay planks so they can move these cannon over the trestle bridge. Now, the trouble is that uh, they had to drag, the mules kind of panic, so the men themselves had to drag uh, 14 field guns, 12 pounders, and one eight inch dog rims that had to push them across the uh, trestle bridge. And that was done by Colonel Henry M. Elmore's 20th Texas Infantry. Uh, and actually, one of the soldiers serving in Company K, 20th Texas, the young musician, Private Carl Heinrich Ludwig, Ludwig Gerloff, said it was the hardest task of his life moving the cannons, not only across the trestle bridge, but also into the sand. So they now have positioned themselves. They can get an enfilade fire upon the Federals. And so before 5 a.m. on the morning of January 1st, 1863, Magruder shouted, boys, we will now give them hell. Boys, I have done my part as a private, as he fired the first gun. And now I will go and attend to that of a general. They all applauded his shot from his manly eye. Oh my gosh, all these men are really key. Um, however, the Oswego and the Harriet Lane, as the Confederate troops advance, pour shot into them. It was quite an unequal duel between the Confederate uh, cannon and like the Harriet Lane's nine inch and uh, 11 inch Dahlgrens. Some Confederates fled their position. Uh, the Westfield, however, trying to come to support, will run again on Pelican Spit. And um, they uh, uh, actually, the Confederates are forced to abandon their artillery positions because their federal, the federal guns were so hot. During this, this shelling, in the pre-dawn early mist, uh, Colonel Joseph Cook will lead 500 volunteers with ladders 
into the bay to try and climb up on the wharf to cut off the Union soldiers. Guess what? The ladders are too small, and so they will fall back from the wharf area. As Magruder has his men back into the town around 18th Street, all of a sudden, the Bayou City and the Neptune appeared out of the early morning's gloom, laden with gun smoke. The Bayou City fired a 32-pounder into the Harriet Lane, causing serious damage to the gunboat. Weir called out, well, here goes for a New Year's present. His gun fired and it exploded, killing Weir. Undaunted, Leon Smith, there he is, sends his ship into, he's got a ram, and so he sends his ship into the side of the Harriet Lane, but hits a glancing blow. So he goes and starts to circle round as the Neptune, there's a Harriet Lane, as the Neptune will advance towards the Harriet Lane. Harriet Lane sends a shot through the hull. Fortunately, the Neptune sinks in shallow water so that Harvey can continue firing his gun at the Harriet Lane. And so this caused the Harriet Lane to pay all its attention to the Neptune while the Bayou City will make a huge circle and come around at the Harriet Lane with a full head of steam. Colonel Tom Green sharpshooters forced many of the gunboat steam seamen's as they boarded, they dropped the Corvus as they rammed the ship, dropped the Corvus. Uh, Green forces the crew members under deck. And I'll tell you that the, the uh, Harriet Lane strikes just aft of the port wheel. Uh, and so they have to this close firefight. Um, uh, captain or lieutenant commanding uh, Wainwright already wounded twice. Uh, he's still rallying his men, and Leon Smith comes up to him and shoots him in the head, um, and he dies. The executive officer, Edward Lee, uh, will try to rally his men, but he too was mortally wounded as the rest of the Harriet Lane's officers and men surrendered. Wow. So it just so happens that one of Magruder's aides, friends from West Point, Major Albert Lee, found his son mortally wounded on the Harriet Lane. And as the major comforted his son, the young man told his father, you have seen what I've done my duty to the last and have died fighting for my country. Tell them at home, I still love them. Well, this is really terrible. And there's a lull in the action because the Westfield has run aground. Captain Lubbock, Henry Lubbock, goes out to the gunboat Clinton uh, Clifton, excuse me, and demanded the surrender of the American squ uh, the U.S. squadron. Now, <clears throat> he arranges for a three-hour truce, and General Scurry then demands the immediate surrender of Burrell's uh, Massachusetts troops. They surrender, and however, uh, Commander Renshaw of the Westfield says, um, I ain't surrendering, right? And so this picture is great, Neptune, Bayou City. Uh, so what's gonna happen is he believed this old adage of sink before surrender. So he made plans to scuttle the Westfield. There was no way they could get it off the sand bank, uh, sand bank or shoal as we would call it, because uh, it was really stuck in the mud. And so the crew evacuated around 10 a.m. Just remember, this battle has lasted five hours and it's a complete turn of events. The Confederates, unable to, soldiers are unable to take the wharf. When the cotton, cotton clads show up, they're able to turn the advantage uh, to, that um, is uh, uh, Wainwright, um, and turn the advantage uh, for the Confederates with the capture of the Harriet Lane. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Lubbock has warned the commander of the Clifton, looky here, we've got the 
Harriet Lane floating and ready to bring it out into the harbor. Well, actually, it was listing because of the hole caused by the ram. So um, the crew evacuates the um, uh, Westfield and Renshaw will personally go and light the fuse. He had set the fuse himself. Sadly, he had not accounted for the timing properly. So as he comes back up on deck, right, he's pouring turpentine everywhere to really make the explosion great. And when he's getting ready to get in this cutter, he will look back upon his ship and a huge sulfurous cloud will rise from the ship this large explosion that could be heard as far away as Houston. And uh, uh, the gunboat was seen to part or burst forward. And when the smoke cleared away, there was no sign of life about her. Forward, she was blown into fragments down to the water. Commander Richard Law now assumed command of the squadron and he refused to follow the truce agreement. And actually, Leon Smith gets on this tug or tender known as the John F. Carr and tries to chase after the Clifton. Uh, the car doesn't have the power to catch up and the Union ships will, ex the rest of the Union fleet will escape. However, I have to tell you, this is a complete victory, both morally and in essence, uh, for the Confederates. They captured two barks, the Ellis Pike and the Bellow, containing 700 tons of coal and 600 barrels of Irish potatoes. Uh, and they captured the pilot schooner. The Union lose two warships. They suffered 420 casualties. In turn, the Confederates lost 26 killed and 117 wounded. While the Confederates proclaimed the blockade was over, federal ships were soon back on station. Now, I have to tell you that um, uh, the Battle of Galveston is throughout the South, people cheer and they laud um, uh, Magruder for his brilliant victory that was akin to his days on the peninsula. Jefferson Davis, who did not like Magruder, sent him a letter. I am much gratified at the receipt of your letter of January 6th, conveying to me the details of your brilliant exploit in the capture of Galveston and the vessels in the harbor. The boldness of the conception and the daring and skill of its execution were crowned by results substantial as well as splendid. Your success has been a heavy blow to the enemy's hopes and I trust will be vigorously and effectively followed up. The congratulations I tender to you and your brave army are felt by the whole country, and I trust that your achievement is but a precursor of a series of successes which may rebound to the glory and honor of yourself and our country. Wow. Magruder, the fallen leader after Battle of Maverick Hill, the claims of drunkenness, the claims of ineptitude, all have been forgotten. He was once again the great hero of Big Bethel of the Siege of Yorktown. And uh, I have to tell you, Prince John was considered a hero for all times. His victory on January 1st, 1863, cast more laurels upon him. And um, I have to say that uh, the victory that he had achieved was uh, beyond expectations. Just to have uh, 3,000 Confederate troops, two cotton clads, defeat two Union gunboats with heavy armament is an achievement that was never again replicated in Texas nor the Confederacy. One of the units that will serve there at um, Galveston will be known as the Jeff Davis Guard, and they will play a huge role later that year in defending um, uh, Texas coast at uh, Sabine Pass. And that'll be another story that perchance I'll tell you again. So without 
uh, uh, any um, uh, further ado, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. So no questions? Well, I have everybody on mute, so hang on just a second yeah, here. Turn them off. There's someone with a question. Brian, I mean, okay, go ahead. Tom? Oh, yes. Um, I know after the Battle of uh, Nashville, my ancestors unit was sent to Galveston to repair the railroad. Um, to Houston and beyond. Who destroyed that railroad, do you know? Um, that railroad was uh, actually, um, you know, the Confederacy, especially in Texas, had nowhere to get more rails. You know, the maintenance of the railroad and its locomotives were beyond the infrastructure in Texas. And so they couldn't ship, so to get stuff from New Orleans, you'd have to ship it by wagon to a railhead and thence to Houston. So the only way they got supplies like that is by running the blockade. And so it was not the destruction by anybody of the Trestle Bridge. Instead, it was actually the need for repair. And that, that would be, the, you know, uh, by 64, 65, the Confederate uh, infrastructure, especially their railroad infrastructure, is failing. Why? The only place in the South they built locomotives was where? Treadiger Ironworks. And what is it doing? It's making iron plate for um, ironclads. It's making cannon. Um, so just like Sherman say, said, he couldn't believe the South thought they could win this war because the place where all the locomotives were made were in the North, where all the factories made in the North, that the South couldn't even make, take their cotton themselves and turn it into cloth. So that's what's happening in Texas. And Texas is out of the way. Um, it does become of great interest at the end of the war, actually Alfred Terry is going to organize a huge, with uh, Edward Canby, an expedition to Texas because of what the French are doing in Mexico. So uh, uh, in fact, uh, many commanders like uh, John Bankhead Magruder will serve for Maximilian uh, after the war. Okay, what else would you like to know? Yes, I can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. What, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Good. What role did Galveston play after Magruder's uh, uh, victory? Well, <clears throat> it was the leading um, blockade runner's haven for uh, west of the Mississippi. Uh, just remember uh, the next port from New Orleans uh, going uh, westward is Galveston. So those supplies that are coming in are supporting uh, um, Edmund Kirby Smith's um, Department of the Trans-Mississippi. So the guns, the cannons are actually going to be used uh, during the Battle of Mansfield and the repulse of um, the Banks Red River campaign. So that's where they're getting their muskets. That's where they're getting cannon. That's where they're getting other types of supplies. There's no place in Texas that can make, guess what? Shells. There's no place in Texas that can make gunpowder. They do have one work called the Dance Brothers that make a revolver. But to get the powder to fire that gun, it's a whole totally different story. So they didn't have a major powder works in Texas. So all those types of things, plus blankets, clothing, there's no cotton mills, there's no nothing in Texas. You know, Texas is, as uh, Thomas North said, a pioneer state and it was rough and tumble. And Magruder had served there before the war, 
both during the Mexican War and then thereafter. Uh, so he was familiar with Texas. They were familiar with him. So that's what enabled him to take command and maintain control of Texas. Uh, you know, just getting them rations and so forth was a logistical nightmare for the Confederacy um, in Texas. So um, there are numerous people that complain about the lack of food, the lack of shoes. Uh, you can just well imagine. Galveston is the biggest city in Texas. It's got 6,000 people. So go get that, you know. Uh, times have changed. <laughs> we don't think that Texas as being really the frontier as much as it really was because Magruder not only had to defend his coastline and worry about the Federals coming down the Red River Valley and so forth, coming up uh, Buffalo Bayou, um, Sabine's Pass. He also had to fight Comanches, right? They're wild and crazy uh, in the western part of Texas. So it is a, uh, they're fighting two enemies with limited amount of resources. Any other questions? Is there anything in Galveston that commemorates this battle? Is there anything left? Uh, they've got the Coons Wharf at the end of, I think it's 18th Street, is still there. Uh, mm -hmm. However, the town is built up. Remember, it was destroyed by a hurricane, a terrible hurricane. I think it's 1903. Mm -hmm. So all the buildings that were there during the time, boom, they're blown down. The some of the cannon had, was taken to the Battle of San Jacinto, where they are today, especially the twin sisters. There is one monument, an obelisk, that honors John Bankhead Magruder for his brilliant exploit on the early morning hours of 1 January 1863. So, I, I mean, I've been there. Uh, it, you, you actually, when you're down on the harbor, you can actually see Pelican Island. Um, you can see the buoys where the shoals are. Uh, you can, there's still a trestle, a, a, a bridge at the same side of the trestle bridge. So you can actually visually, although it's not like going to the Battle of uh, Sharpsburg, you know, uh, <laughs> but you have to place it in your mind. You have to imagine it, yeah. You have to imagine it. Um, because Galveston, uh, number one, became a, the major port for Texas until Houston, they dredged uh, Buffalo Bayou, so it became the leading port. And then it was destroyed in that hurricane and never recovered as much as it could have. So mm -hmm. uh, that's my story today. Um, but uh, yeah, I go to a lot of places like, uh, like in Hampton Roads, you know, the water's still there. You can stand on Newport News Point and you go, wow, that happened there. You can see the Elizabeth River, blah, blah, blah. But you also see these big colliers, you know, and container ships. And uh, they would not have been there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> aircraft carriers and everything. But it's still pretty awesome. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, I think Paul had a question. Uh, unmute yourself, please. Now, were there any other attempts after that battle for the North to take Galveston back again? No, there was not. Um, they, um, they concentrated on Mobile Bay. Then they concentrated on Wilmington. Once those two ports had been closed, you know, Farragut goes on sick leave after Mobile Bay. Um, David Porter takes command of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. S.P. Lee takes command of the West Gulf Coast Blockading Squadron. He's not a real motivated guy, right? And so they don't do anything until um, when the war is nearing its conclusion. That's when they uh, organize two different expeditions. One will come out of Mobile Bay with Edward Canby once Mobile the city of Mobile surrenders. And then another one will be organized in Hampton Roads under the command of Alfred Terry. And they're supposed to go down to Galveston and Houston and Brownsville, right? Because Brownsville is right across the river from Matamoros. And so that's where the Frenchies are. And so they really wanted to uh, limit European, remember the Monroe Doctrine, 
the Civil War didn't allow us to pay attention to the Mor uh, uh, Monroe Doctrine. And so, boom, this was, you know, this was a threat in action. I think there's some Hocus Pocus movie with uh, Rock Hudson and somebody else about it. I can't remember it. I saw it probably when I was a younger guy, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I try to remember the name of, but because Rock Hudson was a Confederate with a bad Southern accent. I think John Wayne was in it, a couple other stars. I don't, I, you know, uh, if I had a chance to see the movie again, I'd probably watch it with great laughs, you know. Oh, The Undefeated. Pardon? It's called The Undefeated. Oh, yeah. thank you. I'll try and look it up. Uh, you, so you remember it, you know. So that's what was going on in Texas at the end of the war. So Magruder, Edmund Kirby Smith, Scurry, they all go down to Mexico. Eventually, Magruder will come back to New York, um, where he'll begin uh, giving lectures about uh, the Texas, about Mexico, about the Mexican War, about how great he is. Actually, he fills lecture halls, lyceums in New Orleans and Mobile. But I also like to say he probably stood at bars and gave a good story for the drinks um, because he will die um, in 1870, right? Uh, he is 61 years old. Um, wow. Acute alcoholism. Um, and, uh, and he dies, he drops dead in the street. Well, drops dead, not dead in the street, but he drops, takes him up to a hotel room that his friends were paying for. Everyone looked out for him because he was in essence penniless. His wife, Henrietta Van Camp, you've heard that name before, uh, she had left Magruder in early 1850s and moved to Venice and owned a piazza on the canal. So, you know, uh, she didn't really think too much of Magruder anymore because he was, um, let's just say, I have all these stories about him. In fact, I could give a great lecture just about him <laughs> where I'd bring out all these other like juicy stories. I have to tell you. <laughs> uh, I guess that's not for today. Um, all so, the dirt. <clears throat> Anybody else have a question? Um, if not, um, I have to tell you that I have a blog. Um, the Mariners Museum has a website with civil, my Civil War blogs. Um, and in essence, um, you can read all about the Battle of Galveston. I wrote a blog about it. I call it about 3,000 words or 4,000, I can't remember. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, really pretty neat story once you get your arms around it. So just go to the Mariners Museum website. Tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a lecture, Zoom lecture, at noon for the Mariners Museum about, uh, what am I talking about tomorrow? Um, oh, ballooning in the Civil War. <laughs> I can't remember what lecture I'm giving on at, what day, you know, I gotta get reminded in the morning. But you can register for that by going on the Mariners Museum website. I will send Rebecca a link to it. She, she can share it with you all, okay? And it's free to the public. It's a great story. Magruder's not there, otherwise he probably would have fallen out of the balloon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is a good story about the Confederate balloon. Nevertheless, so anyway, uh, once again, I thank you all, uh, and well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. you. Right. You thank that you. was great. <laughs> bye bye. Next month. Thank you. Uh huh. Bye bye. Next month, guys, we're meeting on uh, via Zoom on December the tenth, and our speaker will be uh, Dr. Mary Elizabeth Ellard. She's going to talk about veterinary medicine in the Civil War. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we are coming up on the end of the year when we'll be hitting you up for dues again. Okay. So we haven't met in person. We still want your money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank you for Thank all you. Thank you. You're welcome. See you later, guys. Thank you. Stay safe. See everybody. you later. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.